and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time, let me give you a quick rundown on what we're all about. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we build fun and inexpensive focused Commander decks. A focused Commander deck is more tuned than a casual deck, but not quite to the level of a competitive or optimized deck. This episode's going to be a special one, though, where we exclude the price of the Commander. With only a $25 budget, it's pretty much impossible to build around some Commanders without doing so. And also, there are times when you just open up a Commander in a pack or trade for them because you just really want to build around them. Our budget is still going to be $25, but just for 99 cards because, again, we're not including the Commander in that cost. Prices on this show are powered by our sponsor, TCG Player. Before we get started, make sure you go hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date in the latest Commander's Quarters videos. This episode's even more special, though, because it's a patron-selected deck tech. Once a month, patrons will vote on what Commander they want to see on an upcoming deck tech. And the Commander that received the most votes for this deck tech was Animar Soul of Elements. Animar is a 1-1 elemental that costs blue, red, green. It has protection from white and from black. Whenever you cast a creature spell, put a plus one plus one counter on Animar. And creature spells you cast cost one less to cast for each plus one plus one counter on Animar. So Animar is a really fun commander to build around and there are a ton of ways to abuse him. So the way that I chose to build him was by building a morph deck. So for those of you that don't know, morph is a keyword ability that allows us to play a creature face down as a 2-2 for just three mana. At any time, we can pay its morph cost to turn it face up and sometimes it even triggers an ability on that creature. Creatures with Morph work great with Animar since we can reduce their cost to nothing just by getting three counters on Animar. So what's our strategy for this deck? Well, we need to get Animar out quickly and then start casting Morphs to start reducing our costs. Again, it only takes three counters on Animar to reduce the cost of casting a Morph creature to zero. But there are other kinds of creatures in our deck too, so the more counters that we can get on Animar, the better. So how are we going to win with this deck? Well, we need to overwhelm our opponents with our giant army or we're going to combo off to beat them. Our morph creatures may start off as just two twos, but we can flip them over to turn them into bigger and better creatures. And there are a couple of infinite combos in this deck that can help us win in a variety of ways. Each of these combos revolves around using Animar to reduce the cost of our creatures. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to take you through 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how you're going to win with it. So let's start off with tactic number one, Helping Hands. Beast Caller Savant, Rattleclaw Mystic, and Drover of the Mighty can each tap for any one of our colors. On top of that, Beast Caller Savant has haste so we can use him right away. And Rattleclaw Mystic even has a morph cost, and when she's turned face up, she's going to add green, blue, red to our mana pool. Then we've got Sakura Tribe Elder, Dawn Trader Elk, and Diligent Farmhand, each of which we can sacrifice to search our library for a basic land and put into play tapped. Elvish Rejuvenator, Farhaven Elf, and Yavamaya Granger are each going to go get us a land when they come into play. Elvish Rejuvenator is limited to just the top 5 cards of our library, but it can get any land. Whereas Farhaven Elf and Yavamaya Granger have to go get a basic land. On top of that, Yavamai Granger actually has an echo cost, so unless we pay another 3 during our next upkeep, she's going to go straight to the graveyard. And finally, there's Fertilid, which comes into play with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. We can pay 1 in a green to remove one of its plus 1 plus 1 counters to search our library for a basic land and put the play tapped. Now, you may have noticed that every single one of our ramp cards in this deck is a creature. The reason for this is actually twofold. When we cast them, we get to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Animar, and it's going to reduce the cost of our other creatures. And then being creatures themselves, their cost is actually reduced by the number of plus 1 plus 1 counters on Animar. Alright, so we've talked about how to set ourselves up by ramping and fixing our mana, but how do we set up the rest of our deck? Let's go through some of those ways in tactic number two, Dress for Success. First up, we've got Trail of Mystery, which is going to help us in two ways. First, whenever a creature enters the battlefield face down, we're going to get to search our library for basic land and put into our hand. And then as soon as we turn that creature face up, it gets plus two plus two until the end of the turn. Just a quick note, the reason that I'm saying face down creature specifically instead of morph is because we have a few manifest cards in this deck. But we'll get to those later. Then we've got Secret Plans and a Fetter Runecaster, both of which pretty much do the exact same thing. Whenever we turn one of our creatures face up, we get to draw a card. On top of that, Secret Plans is going to give all of our face down creatures plus zero plus one. Next up, we've got Beast Whisperer, Primordial Sage, and Soul of the Harvest, each of which do pretty much the exact same thing. Whenever we cast a creature spell, we get to draw a card. We have over 60 creatures in this deck, so we're going to be drawing a ton of cards. And again, with those morph creatures, as long as we have three plus one plus one counters on Animar, we can cast them for free. So with the right setup, we can pretty much draw through our entire deck. And then we've got Garrick's Horde, which is going to allow us to play with the top card of our library revealed, and then if the top card of our library is a creature card, we can cast it. This card comes in huge. Again, we're running a ton of creatures in this deck, so chances are there's going to be a creature on top. Another card that comes in big for this deck is Tashana Voice of Thunder. When Tashana enters the battlefield, we get to draw a card for each creature that we control, and on top of that, we're going to have no maximum hand size as long as she's in play. And since her power and toughness are each equal to the number of cards in our hand, she can be huge. Finally, there's Paradoxical Outcome, which is the only instant that we're running in this deck. Paradoxical Outcome will let us return any number of target non-land, non-token permanents we control back to our hand, and then we draw a card for each card returned this way. So we can use this defensively if we want to save our creatures from a wrath, or we can use it in order to draw a ton of cards. 
With Animar in play and a couple of counters on it, it doesn't take long for us to just throw a ton of morph creatures onto the battlefield. By returning them back to our hand, we can draw a ton of cards and then just recast them for free, making Animar even bigger. And if we have something like Beast Whisperer in play, then we get to draw even more cards when we're recasting them. So we've talked about some spells that help us dig deeper in our deck, but there are also some morph creatures that help us do that too. Let's go through them now in tactic number three, Known Value. First up is Unblinking Blood, which has whenever it or another permanent we control is turned face up, we can scry for two. Now while this technically doesn't give us any actual card advantage, scrying is going to help us fix our next draws so that we actually get the cards that we want. Then we've got Fathom Seer and Riptide Survivor, both of which are going to draw cards when they morph. Fathom Seer is going to draw us two cards, and Riptide Survivor will draw us three after we discard two. Next up is Heisterdon, which will draw us a card whenever it deals combat damage to a player. When we're attacking our opponents with morph creatures, it makes it very difficult for them to determine who to block and what to block them with. Since they can't see what the creature is underneath, we could morph any one of them and it could be bigger than the creature that they're blocking with. This makes it very easy for us to get Hystrodon through at least once to draw us a card when we morph it. And then we've got Den Protector, which is the first creature that we've seen with Megamorph. Megamorph is pretty much the exact same thing as Morph, but when we turn them face up, they get a plus one plus one counter. In addition to that, when we turn Den Protector face up, we get to return target card from our graveyard to our hand. Again, Recursion isn't technically drawing a card, but it's still card advantage since we're getting a card back. So we've talked about ramping, we've talked about drawing cards and getting card advantage. What are some ways that we can actually get some pressure on our opponents though? Let's go through some of those in tactic number four, Big Producers. First up, we've got Broodhatch Nantuko, which whenever it's dealt damage, we get to create that many 1-1 green insect creature tokens. Now normally our opponents would avoid attacking into or blocking this guy with anything that's big. But since he has morph, we can surprise our opponents with him and get a ton of insects. Thelonite Hermit is another creature that we can morph for some value. When we turn it face up, we get four 1-1 one, one green sapling creature tokens, and our sapling creatures get plus one plus one. Next up is Hooded Hydra, which when we morph it, we get five plus one plus one counters on it. And then when it dies, we get to put a 1-1 one, one green snake creature token onto the battlefield for each one of those plus one plus one counters. And then there's Salt Road Ambushers, which is another great addition to the deck. Salt Road Ambushers has, whenever another permanent you control is turned face up, if it's a creature, put two plus one plus one counters on it. We're running a ton of creatures in this deck, and the vast majority of creatures are morph creatures. So with Salt Road Ambushers in play, we get to create even more value with those creatures morphing. And finally, there's Forgotten Ancient, which isn't a morph creature, but it adds a lot of value to our deck. It has, whenever a player casts a spell, you may put a plus one plus one counter on Forgotten Ancient. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, you may move any number of plus one plus one counters from Forgotten Ancient onto other creatures. Again, with this deck, we're going to be casting a ton of spells in a turn. So this guy's going to get a plus one plus one counter, not just from all of those spells that we cast, but all of the spells that our opponents cast too. And then we can redistribute those plus one plus one counters however we see fit during our next upkeep. This means that we can make threats out of all of our creatures if we want to, or just stack them up on one creature if we have to. And that creature can be Animar, and that's just going to reduce the cost of our creature spells even more. So we've talked about some tactics that help us go wide, but let's talk about going big in tactic number five, big hitters. First up, we've got Primal Whisperer, which is going to get plus two plus two for each face down creature in play. With the number of morphs that we have in this deck, this guy can get out of control quickly. On top of that, it's a morph creature, so we can surprise our opponents by flipping them up during combat. Next up is Sagu Mahler, which is a 6-6 with Trample and Hexproof, and it's only going to cost us 5 to morph it. But perhaps one of our biggest threats in the deck is actually Akroma Angel of Fury. Akroma has Flying, Trample, Protection from White and Blue, and she even has Fire Breathing. On top of that, we can cast her as a morph and then morph her for just 6. If we decide to hardcast her though, she can't be countered, but it's going to cost us 8 mana total. So we've talked about our own threats, but how do we deal with some of those things that our opponents are doing? Let's go through some of those ways in tactic number six, counter service. First off, we've got Mischievous Quainar, which has a very unique ability. First off, whenever we turn it face up, we can copy target instant or sorcery spell and then choose new targets for that copy. But on top of that, we can pay three blue blue to turn it back to being face down. That means that we can keep using its ability over and over again. Then we've got Willbender, which when it's turned face up, we get to change the target of target spell or ability with a single target. Next up, we've got a couple of creatures that can just straight up counter our opponent's spells when they're morphed. Stratus Dancer is going to be able to counter target instant or sorcery spell. Silumgar Spell Eater will counter a spell unless its controller pays 3. And Void Mage Apprentice can counter any spell. But the best of our morph countering abilities has to go to Keru Spell Snatcher. When it's turned face up, we get to counter target spell and then exile it. And then we can cast that card without paying its mana cost for as long as it remains exiled. This card is great at helping take our opponent's best spell and then turning it back around on them. But what are some other ways that we can deal with our opponent's spells? Let's go through them now in tactic number 7, deal with it. First up we've got Ice Feather Raven and Echo Tracer, both of which have pretty much the exact same ability when they morph. When they morph, we get to return target creature to its owner's hand. The only difference between the two is that Ice Feather Raven actually can't target itself. And then we've got Thousand Winds, which comes in huge for this deck in a variety of ways. 
When we turn it face up, we return all other tapped creatures to their owner's hands. So if one of our opponents has all their creatures tapped out and they're swinging at us, we can just return them all back to their hand. Or if we're set up to take advantage of it, we can actually just return all of our morph creatures back to our hand. Again, if we just have a couple of counters on Animar, we can cast them again for free and we can get value out of it. So Animar is going to get some more plus one plus one counters, and if we have something like Beast Whisperer in play, we can draw more and more cards. And then there's Dulcet Sirens, which has a very unique ability. Just by paying a blue and tapping it, we can make target creature attack target opponent this turn if it's able. This is a very good way to either put pressure on an opponent, or to get rid of some troublesome creatures. And finally we've got Anox Survivalist and Antuco Vigilante, both of which pretty much do the exact same thing when they're morphed. When we turn them face up, they're going to destroy target artifact or enchantment. So we've talked about dealing with our opponent's cards, but we still have some tricks up our sleeve. So let's go through them now in tactic number 8, Life Circumstances. First up we've got Misfire Weaver, which when it's turned face up, we get to give target creature we control hexproof until the end of the turn. This is just another great way of saving one of our creatures when they get targeted, especially Animar. Then we've got Jeering Instigator, which when it's turned face up, we get to gain control of target creature until the end of the turn, untap that creature, and it gains haste until the end of the turn. Now this ability only applies when it's our turn, so we're pretty much going to be using this to attack. Next up is Crumbshell Crab, which when it's turned face up, we get to exchange control of target creature and opponent controls with one that we control. We're running plenty of creatures in this deck that aren't necessarily very strong after they're morphed, so it's an easy choice to actually switch that creature with one of our opponent's powerful creatures. And then there's Riptide and Trancer, which when it deals combat damage to a player, we can sacrifice it and gain control of target creature that they control. Again, having a lot of morphs on the battlefield makes it difficult for our opponents to determine which creature to block, so it's very easy to get Riptide and Trancer to sneak through. And finally, there's Fortune Thief, which can save us in the most dire of circumstances. It has damage that would reduce your life total to less than 1, reduces it to 1 instead. So we can keep this card face down to keep it safe, and then flip it up when we need to. So we've talked about how to prevent us from losing the game, but what are some ways that we can win the game? Let's go through some of those ways in tactic number 9, Combo Meals. Brine Elemental and Vesuvian Shapeshifter are both pieces of what's called the Pickles combo. Brine Elemental has, when it's turned face up, each opponent skips his or her next untap step. And then Vesuvian Shapeshifter has, when it enters the battlefield or is turned face up, we can choose another creature on the battlefield. And then if we do that, until it's turned face down, it becomes a copy of that creature and it gains, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may turn this creature face down. So basically, when we turn Vesuvian Shapeshifter up and make him a copy of Brine Elemental, it's going to make everyone skip their own tap step but us. And then at the beginning of our upkeep, we can turn it back face down and then do the same thing over and over again. Basically, unless our opponents can deal with one of these creatures, they're not going to have an untap step for the rest of the game. And then there's Cloud of Fairies, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to untap two lands. Peregrine Drake is very similar, but in a bigger way, we get to untap five lands when it comes into play. The next piece of this combo involves Team or Sabretooth. So with Peregrine Drake, it's actually very simple. When we cast it, we get to untap 5 lands. Now most of the time with Animar in play, we're going to have a lot of counters on it, so that cost is going to be reduced to just a blue. So we're basically just going to pay 1 mana to untap 5 lands, generating 4 extra mana. Then we can just use 2 of that mana to return Peregrine Drake back to our hand with Timber Saber 2's ability. Then we can cast it again and again and again, generating infinite mana and infinite enter the battlefield triggers. Cloud of Fairies can also work like this, but since it only untaps 2 lands, we have to have lands that actually tap for more than 1 mana. We are running a few of those in this deck, but both Peregrine Drake and Cloud of Fairies are both great on their own anyway. And if we've got both Cloud of Fairies and Peregrine Drake, they can go infinite with Equilibrium or Tide Spout Tyrant. When they do that, we can return all of our opponent's creatures back to their hand with Equilibrium, and with Tide Spout Tyrant, we can return all of their permanents. Tide Spout Tyrant's even better for this deck because we can actually just keep returning our morphs back to our hand over and over again. We just need one in our hand and one in play to do so. Again, all these infinite enter the battlefield effects can trigger a variety of things. First off, they're going to trigger Animar and make him infinitely big. And if Beast Whisper is in play, we can draw our entire deck if we want to. But outside of Cloud of Fairies, Peregrine Drake, and our Morphs, there's a card that's even better. Ancestral Statue is the golden pig for this deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. It's a 3-4 golem that costs 4, and it has, when it enters the battlefield, return a non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. So once we get at least 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters on Animar, Ancestral Statue is not going to cost us anything to cast. And when we do cast it, we can just return it back to our hand with its Enter the Battlefield ability. We can do this over and over again as many times as we want. Again, this is going to trigger all of our Enter the Battlefield triggers including Animar, Tide Spout Tyrant, or even Beast Whisperer. This is the only card in our deck that can truly just combo with just itself and Animar. And that's why it's the Golden Pig of the deck. And finally we've got Thought Harvester, which works great with Ancestral Statue when we have that infinite combo going on. Thought Harvester has, whenever we cast a colorless spell, target opponent exiles the top card of his or her library. So again, with our infinite combos that either involve Ancestral Statue or our Morph Creatures, we can actually just exile all of our opponent's libraries and win the game. So we talked about how we're going to defend ourselves with this deck, we talked about how we're going to win with this deck, let's talk about some utility cards that bring it all together. 
So it's time to go into tactic number 10, round it out. When we turn Master of the Veil face up, we can turn target creature with more face down. And Weaver of Lies does this in an even bigger way. When it's turned face up, we can turn any number of target creatures with morph other than it face down. Then we've got Ixidora Reality Sculptor, which is going to give all of our face down creatures plus one plus one. On top of that, we can play two and a blue to turn target face down creature face up. This comes in handy when some of our morph costs are a little higher than three. Next up is Teamer War Shaman, which is going to manifest the top card of our library when it comes into play. Manifesting is when we put the top card of our library onto the battlefield face down and it's a 2-2 creature. Then it has whenever a creature we control is turned face up, we can have it fight target creature that we don't control. This is just a really good way for us to take out some of our opponent's creatures. Then there's Whisper Wood Elemental, which has at the beginning of your end step, manifest the top card of your library. And then at any time we can sacrifice him to give all of our non-token creatures we control when this creature dies, manifest the top card of our library. So not only can this guy get us more and more creatures onto the battlefield that are manifested, but it can also protect us from rats. Now it won't actually save any of our creatures from that wrath, but it's going to give us some value when they die. Finally, there's Ixadron, which is kind of a wrath in itself. When Ixadron enters the battlefield, we get to turn all other non-token creatures face down. And then his power and toughness are each equal to the number of face down creatures on the battlefield. So every single creature on the battlefield, including our opponents, have to be turned face down. Now the majority of decks aren't running morph creatures, so they can't actually turn those cards back face up. That means our opponent's creatures, including their commanders, are going to be stuck as two twos on the battlefield that are face down. Whereas we can turn our creatures with more face up. Now this does negatively impact us when Animar's on the battlefield and he gets turned face down, but there are ways for us to get him back. We can either use Ixidor's ability to flip him back face up, or we can bounce him back to our hand with one of our many abilities to do so. This is a very fast and powerful deck that's a ton of fun to play. But now that we've gone through the cards that help us win with this deck, let's go through the cards that help make it happen. It's time to go on to the mana base. We're going to be running 35 lands in this deck, including Opal Palace. Opal Palace can tap for a colorless. Or we can pay one and tap it to add one mana of any color in our commander's color identity. And if we spent that mana to cast Animar, it's going to enter the battlefield with a number of plus one plus one counters on it, equal to the number of times that we've cast it from the command zone. Basically, this land is just very good at helping us set up Animar to reduce the cost of our creatures without having to cast any additional creatures to do so. Next up is Frontier Bivouac, which enters the battlefield tapped by can tap for any of our colors. And then there's Thornwood Falls, Rugged Highlands, and Swiftwater Cliffs, each of which enter the battlefield tapped, gain us a life, it can tap for one of two of our colors. Simic Growth Chamber, Gruel Turf, and Is It Boiler Works each enter the battlefield tapped, and when they come into play, we have to return a land we control back to our hand. But each of them tap for two of our colors when they untap. And then there's Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap to sacrifice to search our library for a basic land and put into play tapped. Next up is Bant, Grixis, Jund, and Naya Panorama, each of which can tap for a colorless, or we can pay one to tap and sacrifice them to search our library for one of two of our basic lands. Then there's Warped Landscape and Terminal Moraine, both of which can tap for a colorless mana, or we can pay two to tap and sacrifice them to search for any basic land and put into play tapped. Finally, we're going to be running 19 basic lands. Ten of those are going to be a forest, seven will be an island, and two will be a mountain. Alright, now that we've gone through every single card in this deck, let's do a quick price check. Just a quick reminder that our deck costs are calculated using TCG Player Optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damaged cards because those cards need a home too. The average Animar EDH rec deck is going to set you back $80.93, so let's see how we compare to that. Our deck is going to be much more affordable, coming in at only $24.98. Again, all Commander's Quarters decks are built to be tuned and focused within that $25 budget, but there are always ways that we can improve on them. Let's go through some reasonable upgrades now to see what some of those ways just might be. First up, there's Vizier of the Menagerie, which is going to cost you $2.93. It's a 3-4 Naga Cleric that costs 3 and a green. It has, you may look at the top card of your library. You may cast the top card of your library if it's a creature card. And you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast creature spells. This is just a better version of Garrick's Horde in a great include in this deck. Next up, there's Slate of Ancestry, which comes in at $1.99. Slate of Ancestry is an artifact that costs 4, and it says, Pay 4, tap it, and discard your hand. Draw a card for each creature you control. Again, we're going to have a ton of creatures in play, so this card just helps us dig through our deck very quickly. Then there's Prime Speaker Zagana, which comes in at $2.04. Prime Speaker Zagana is a 1-1 Merfolk Wizard that costs 2 green, green, blue, blue. It's going to enter the battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, where X is the greatest power among creatures that we control. And then when it enters the battlefield, we get to draw cards equal to its power. Again, with this deck, Animar can get huge very quickly, so Zagana is going to draw us a ton of cards. Next up is Death Mist Raptor, which comes in at $1.25. Death Mist Raptor is a 3-3 Lizard Beast that has Death Touch and costs 1 green green. It has, whenever a permanent you control is turned face up, you may return Death Mist Raptor from your graveyard to the battlefield face up or face down. And then it has Mega Morph for 4 and a green. So if this card is ever in our graveyard, it's very easy for us to get it back onto the battlefield with this deck. Next up is Azuri Claw of Progress, which will set you back $8.76. It has whenever a creature with power 2 or less enters the battlefield under your control, you get an experience counter. 
And then at the beginning of combat on your turn, you can put X plus one plus one counters on another target creature you control where X is the number of experience counters that you have. So with this deck, we're gonna get a ton of experience counters with all of our two two morph creatures that come into play. Finally, there's Shaman of the Forgotten Ways, which costs $4.11. It's a 2-3 human shaman that costs 2 and a green. It has tap to add 2 mana and any combination of colors to your mana pool and spend this mana to only cast creature spells. It also has Formidable, so that's an ability that we can only activate if we control creatures that have a total power of 8 or greater. Its Formidable ability is pay 9 green green, tap, each player's life total becomes the number of creatures he or she controls. With this deck, we're able to get a ton of creatures out onto the battlefield in the blink of an eye. So in the right situation, activating this ability can just straight up win us the game. And with that, our show is coming to a close, but I really just want to hear about what you guys think about this deck, so why don't you let me know in the comments below. When you're buying decks like this one, or just individual cards, make sure you're using that TCG Player link in the description below. Not only will you be getting great prices on TCG Player, but you'll also be supporting this show because they sponsor us. And make sure you're following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to get some early hints on who the next commander just might be. And you might have heard that we have the Close Quarters gameplay series coming up as well. So especially make sure that you follow us on Instagram because I'm going to post some behind-the-scenes shots on there. Links to all the Commander's Quarters social media can be found in the description below. Also in the description below is a link to the Commander's Quarters Patreon page, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons who have subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron for the Commander's Quarters, including being able to vote on future Commanders for deck techs. There's even a general level tier where you get your own personalized deck tech dedicated to you. If you enjoyed this deck tech, please like it and subscribe to the channel. And while you're at it, check out some of our other Commander Excluded budget deck techs and super budget episodes. Alright, that's all for me today. Thanks again, and have a good one.